I've been given the opportunity to talk about why Chalmers is uh, venturing into this folio project and why we see folio as an opportunity. Uh, so, there might be people listening who don't know who I am. My name is Daniel Hirschman, and I'm the uh, library director and the head of a department at Chalmers University of Technology called Communication and Learning in Science. Okay, and uh, that's about it uh, when it comes to talking about my university. As a manager, uh, my role is to facilitate and move the library forward. It is in my interest to make sure that our stakeholders understand the value of our library. So my perspective might be very different from, say, a systems librarian. And a systems librarian's perspective is, I want to manage the system in a proper and functional way, and I do not want any problems. Now, those two perspectives might collide, and I think that's a good thing, because one of the biggest challenges for university libraries is change. It's such a big problem or a challenge for libraries that the Horizon Report in the Library Edition named it as one of the most wicked challenges for our profession. And as we think about change, most of us don't have the time <laughs> to think about change because we're busy doing other things. And I'm sure as you sit and work with your systems and someone says, maybe we should do this, you go, ah, I don't have the time because I'm busy. And if you start to think about change and changing your business or maybe stop doing things, I think it's important to have some, some insights. Those insights might be very individual. Uh, so I'm going to share some of, of my personal insights from the last couple of years working at, at Chalmers. At different conferences and in different articles, I've talked about the shift from print to electronic content. This slide is not about that. Today. It's about the fact that we changed our acquisition pattern to buy more print content in the year of 2000. Fine. The problem is that we didn't realize that we were buying more digital content than print content until the year of 2011, 2010. That means that we were doing things for at least 10 years the wrong way. We were still working with old workflows and systems supporting an old way of thinking because we didn't realize that this was happening. I think that was fine seven years ago, but with the pace of change today, I don't think we have the time to waste years as technology shifts. Another insight is that we're dealing with a huge collection, a huge collection of stuff that we don't know that much about. It used to be stuff that we could describe and we could touch, but now we're just acquiring things on the internet. We don't really know what that means, but we're trying to understand what it means. And this is just a crazy amount of results. And this, dealing with this collection, is a challenge, mentally, right? It's a challenge for the vendors to provide us with this information, but it's also a challenge for us to understand what this actually means. And how does it affect the way that we work? I think we're just starting to realize the implications of the digitization of knowledge and the globalization of knowledge. Yeah, I'm not going to talk about any examples. We've, 
we've done so many mistakes, and I'm sure we will continue to do mistakes. Today, we are acquiring more than 98, close to 99% of our annual uh, acquisition, acquisitions budget on digital content. 1% is print. Some might say, okay, you're a technological university. That's fine for you. I say, okay, that's fine for us. But you have to think about what this means in your context. And how large is your digital collection? And what does that mean for you? And what you pay attention to? We still have books. We still have to manage books. I would say we have close to 500,000 items in our collections. We still circulate things. For some of our subjects, books in print are very important. They're not going away. We have to manage them. And maybe even for the 1% of the print resources that we purchase, shouldn't they be more valuable than the stuff that we just acquire on the internet? Because we're committing ourselves to taking care of those resources and adding them to our physical collection. So in one way, that 1% is now more important than it ever has been for us at the Technological University. If you ask a systems librarian about systems, so how does things work, they just go, <gasps> and then they start you know, telling you about how data flows from different services and providers and Somewhere in here, you get very, very confused. Because if something goes wrong in here, you have no idea of where it went wrong. Unless you have people working at your university that actually knows about this stuff. And knowing and understanding the system landscape is becoming an increasingly important part of our profession. It's so important that you can't really say that this is just only for the systems librarian to care about. Or IT is something that the IT department does. Because everyone has to understand this. If they don't, they cannot function within this profession. So you, if, you, if you are in an organization that just has one systems librarian, good for you. But it's going to be a problem for the organization long term. Solving this is not happening because it's that complex for a reason. So if someone says that I'm going to replace all of this with one box in PowerPoint, you should probably not believe them because it's more complex. That goes for any vendor, because what they do is that they will tell you, we're doing this, this new thing, it's amazing, you should get on board. And they talk to, not systems librarians, well, maybe they do, they might talk to a library director, and they say, we have this innovative, new, fantastic thing that will solve this problem for you. All you have to do is give us some money. <laughs> And all of the library directors and managers, or maybe even the vice chancellors of a university, they go, oh, there's an opportunity for innovation. We can be leaders within our field. And they go to these conferences where they talk to each other, and they say, so, do you have Sierra? No, oh, I'm on Olive. Well, we're a really innovative library. We're on Alma. It's the next big thing. And everyone just goes, oh my god, we are missing something. And there's this sense of urgency that we have to change. But that sense of urgency is created by the vendor. And libraries are not in control of the message or even the understanding of where they're headed because they're only paying attention to what vendors are saying. And they're letting vendors define the strategies of universities and libraries. They're even going as far as they're telling libraries how to define their own value. And I think that's a problem. Even in the con context of folio, we have to question the message from commercial interests like EBSCO, 
It's part of the game. It's our own. We have to do that. Another insight is was two weeks ago when I saw this movie. Did you see that? It doesn't it doesn't exist yet. But soon it will. And what are the implications of having access to a technology where you can gather a group of people in a sports hall to experience something that they would see and feel if they went to SeaWorld? What are the implications for a library and for the educational system with this type of technology? And don't tell me you don't feel a sense of urgency that is real of understanding where do we fit in here. That is much more important than understanding or listening to vendors defining our future. But the problem is that we're also busy about thinking where we are. When we need to think about how to change, we just say, well, this is interesting, but we're too busy changing, so uh, we don't have time to change. And if you're a fan of the Silicon Valley uh, TV show, then this is a very memorable episode, and I would highly recommend it. <laughs> so what do we do? Well, as we have worked with user experience and service design within our university and at our university library, we've been studying the user behavior, understanding the motivators and drives of our users so that we can change our services. And instead of having a focus group where we ask our users, what do you want? We ask them, what doesn't work? And we took the same approach to our current landscape. So we said, OK, what are our pain points? And we took a year uh, within a project to evaluate a lot of different systems and actually do full scale tests. And we could come up with things that I think you all recognize. There are limitations with, it, with our current systems, and there are a lot of problems with our current systems. And we would like to have them fixed. And in our evaluation, we did our best to actually do full-scale testing, sometimes with our own data, setting up uh, different areas where we could actually test them. And after we, we did that, still, we ended up doing a lot of speculation and talking about what was right, what should we do, and there was a lot of anxiety about making the wrong decision. Because there's this sense that if we make an investment in a technology or a system, that decision is for is a long-term decision, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. And as we were discussing the, the role of the library system, we were experiencing the same thing as we were seeing when we were talking about the library and how our users were viewing it. Because as we talked to our users about the value of library services and how they looked upon our library, we found out that they see a lot of different things. So when we were talking about the library system, depending on who you were, you were describing something, something that was very different. So just acknowledging this is a step forward. And an experience that can help you make a better decision. In Sweden, there's a, a, a huge movement for Koha. Sort of like a, a FOMO thing, where everyone is saying, oh, we need to go open source, so we should go Koha, because that's the, the thing. And if we're not in Koha, we're missing out. Or we're going to go with this vendor, and we're not, if we're not doing it, we're missing out. So when I look at Koha and the different uh, implementations of Koha, what I saw was a lot of effort going into adjusting an old system 
to work in the way that the library was oper operating today. And I thought, really? Is that what we should invest our development resources into? An old platform to replicate what we're doing today. And how does that, in my role as a manager of the library, help us address this problem of embracing the need for radical change? And in some ways, the systems librarian is now a problem because they're only trying to replicate or describe what they know instead of the drives and the motivators of what the library needs. I understand, speaking to a lot of systems librarians, that it might be sort of a, a good thing to say or not. <laughs> But I think we have to acknowledge that <coughs> systems librarians usually, if they are uh, in, a, in a sole role at the library, are sort of a, an important person that can either help its organization or stop it from evolving, all out of good intentions. And for us, Folio, for me, Folio provides us with a tool and an opportunity to face that wicked challenge. Because we are in a phase where we are rethinking and we are developing and we are implementing new library services that make sense to us and our users. We are trying to pivot. And as we do that, we need the tools that can help us. And right now, we're carrying a big, big couch up, up a, a, a set of narrow stairs. So as we go through this process, just as we go through a service design process or user experience process, we have to think about where we are, where our users are, what they're doing, and why they're doing it. Understanding the context of this library system and how it interacts with other systems. I think there are a few people who question the idea of open science. It's an important part of academia. And I think that also translates into many of the university's IT strategies. The IT strategy of, of Chalmers, for instance, specifically says if there is an open source alternative, you should explore it. Because it goes hand in hand with the openness of the academic culture to promote openness and access and transparency within the systems that we use. But what makes Folio really interesting for me, compared to, for instance, Koha, is that there is a commercial interest. There are commercial entities within this framework that can support the library and the system with services. Because we need data to work with, and we cannot control and own all of the data for ourselves. We are completely dependent on data services and data providers. And I'm not so interested in setting up my own support services or setting up a hosting service locally because I think our systems developers or system administrators should focus on other things. So that's a service that I'm looking that I'm looking for. And the microservices platform, or this microservices architecture, allows us, as we go into this project, from a completely new perspective where we are questioning what we're doing to select the services that we need to fulfill our mission, instead of buying a huge package of services and ending up with a system that is oversized which is currently what we're having. So what we're saying is, okay, in our current context, let's just pick what we need. That's the idea. And that's why we are thrilled to be one of the first libraries into this. Because we are looking for that conversation with the developers and with the commercial entities in this project to define those services. And as we do so, we're starting to build a platform. And that platform can be utilized for many other things. 
I do not envision the systems developers at Chalmers engaging in developing circulation functionality. That would be a waste of time because our developers are experts in other fields of research information. But this platform puts us in a position where we can share the work that we've done with our CRIS system, with our institutional repository, with our ILL system. <clears throat> it gives us a platform to communicate and to evolve those services instead of being isolated and alone, which is what we are right now. And that makes us part of a community. And that is very important for the people working with these systems or as a systems librarian, to feel that you are part of a community that share the responsibilities of caring for these systems. But the best thing, in my perspective, is that there is no way we can lose. Because EBSCO and the other vendors are in a position, and as Neil described in his first presentation, where the marketplace has rapidly changed. So the market has to do something. And they have to invest into this project. If they don't, <clears throat> they are going to die. And if they don't and this project fails, the other option is still there. So I can't see why we shouldn't invest and support this fully. Because it needs to succeed, because the world needs to be a better place <laughs> than it is right now, because it's a sad, sad, sad market. And I cannot for my life see why universities would support it. Thank you. That's it. Will you do exactly? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, will you develop a lot of things, or will you just come in with the input? Or what will you do? Our commitment uh, with EBSCO as a development partner here is to implement the first system and go live with it. Okay. That's our commitment. And we will do whatever it takes to make that happen within the time frame. Time frame being? Well, it was in Richard's slide, I believe. <laughs> January. <laughs> So, uh, we are, well, I, I'm not so sure, but, oh. so we will set up a, the implementation project and we will start implementing at the latest this summer, uh, and then we will start testing, and then we will hopefully be able to go live by the end of 2018. So, that's going to be fun for everyone. <laughs> Sweet Peewit. <laughs> So that's exactly what we're going to do. And the first sort of phase of the system is, is totally focused on, on, on just replacing our old ILS. And then we're looking forward to, to taking it forward. You are building a lot of nice things at Chalmers. Which ones would you share with us if we are in folder? <laughs> Hopefully all of it. I don't see any reason why. We shouldn't. Any other questions? <coughs> right. You're going over with the electronic as well from January, or is that uh, when you say the library system? Is it, I presume it means printed. Stuff. Well, uh, this is. I mean, this is uh, uh, an area of, of concern for. Uh, Many in my staff. It's, uh, uh, how will you deal with uh, with the ERM uh, components if they are not uh, finished? Well, we will solve it. Probably means that we will have to take data out of our current systems and manage that data uh, somewhere in between. Because I don't think I, I mean I would be happy if the uh, the functionality for 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 electronic resource management was in there. Uh, certainly I'm hoping we're aiming for it. 
But if it's not, then we're going to have to solve it. But many of you already solve uh, electronic resource, ma resource management using spreadsheets and other types of solutions. <laughs> so, there's, uh, it's a good tradition. But we're doing this because we think the end result will be better. And we are going to be part of a process where we can actually influence and select what we want. What's, what's really been interesting with um, at the point when, so we had conversations with the, uh, the OA partners as we started to move towards uh, an agreement with Chalmers because Chalmers hadn't necessarily joined the community yet. They had looked at the community saying this is, you know, this is, this is interesting. We need to talk amongst ourselves to understand what this means for us. Um, and it was, it was interesting that the, the OLA partners themselves started to look at, well, what, is this, what does this mean that, that we've had this tradition here of communicating with each other, and we're trying to scale this community, and then there's this um, uh, a little bit more of a radical voice coming in. I, I don't mean to. <laughs> a little more of a radical voice coming into the community and kind of pushing and um, uh, very traditional organizations like University of Chicago, um, uh, um, Duke, you know, almost right away just said that, well, what we need to do is, even though they're technically you know, the first to be uh, a beta within EBSCO hosting, we just have to make sure that they're successful no matter what, which I found... You know, that's in many ways that's kind of EBSCO stepping back from that, from that relationship and allowing for the community to to you know to start to, to you know, build its own group effervescence. Yeah, and I, I think I mean we're we have seen a couple of failed projects, and I think the whole community now recognizes that this cannot fail; it has to in some way succeed. Uh, both from, from the university side and from the commercial side. The market needs this. So, not here. Let's see if it becomes a complete success or maybe partially failure. Can I have no, do or die? Sure. What does your staff say when, when you're sort of saying we have to manage? Because there are lots of today, there are lots of processes in the, in the library that are not supported, I, I think. This is a fine thing too, this folio stuff. But there are lots of processes that are not supported today, and you're just saying we go in with folio and you have to manage. <laughs> how, do, how do they sort of respond to that? Yeah, well, uh, of course, there's an internal process at the university. I would not be here today or in this relationship or talking in the way that I'm doing if the staff was not on board. Uh, they recognize that this is uh, an opportunity uh, to actually do something that has an impact. And they, to my knowledge, I've, I've asked them uh, at several times. <laughs> now is the last time to stop this. <laughs> Speak now or be silent. <laughs> okay. So they, 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 and I, I think we, I mean, we're all a bit afraid because we don't know. And we all see the amount of work, uh, but they know what's what's coming, yeah. and they've been part of making the decision. Yeah. Because that's probably a very important prerequisite to to really have everyone aboard and sort of being aware yeah. of there are going to be difficulties yeah. that we have to. So. But this doesn't, of course, mean that everyone in, within my organization we didn't have a meeting and I said let's do a vote. Uh, because that's not how uh, the workplace yeah. works or functions. Yeah. But we had good conversations, and uh, we've been we've been discussing this for for a long time. Uh, so, as I said, what's the risk? If this fails, then there are commercially viable options, and all we've done is wasted a couple of years and learned a lot in the process. So it's a win. Yeah. I hope it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lisa, you've been part of it? Yeah. Okay. 
Well, so I can speak for everyone, but for myself, I'm very curious and excited about this. And it feels, yeah, yeah, interesting. And it feels good to be doing something that, as you said, disrupts the, the current market. So it's interesting. It will be a learning experience. It will hopefully be good, and it feels good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very good. And we will manage that. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take the challenge. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important that libraries and universities are passive, and we have been we've been made passive the last fifteen years. That stops now. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thank you.